Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you who have come to worship with us at New Hope Christian Church, 1400 South George Washington Drive in Wichita, Kansas. I am Pastor Denny Bell. Our church is meeting every Sunday for worship at 1030 a.m. We are wearing masks, using hand sanitizer, and socially distancing. If you plan to worship with us on Sunday, please come to the double doors under the canopy in the parking lot, and there will be someone there to assist you. The scripture for the message today is Genesis 15, verses 1 through 12, 17 through 18. Then the sermon title is Don't Let Life Defeat You. We extend the invitation for all of you to come and join our church family. The pathway is just the beginning. God will be with us on this Lenten journey, and he will guide our steps along the way. Let's now take a moment to speak to our loving God. Stop us in our tracks, Lord, with your reminder that discipleship is not a sometime thing. We are called to place our whole lives in your care, to follow you, to serve you by caring for others, and not just once in a while, but always. We admit that we're not always ready to do this. The demand is great. The need is great. And our energies are limited. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your care. We know you will give us the strength and courage that we will need for this step on the journey. Be with us. Help us to remember that your love is poured out for all of your people, and you are never, ever far away. We pray this all in your holy name. Amen. In the sharing of this meal, we participate in the fulfillment of God's greatest promise. And we celebrate his son, Jesus Christ, as we remember in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the cup of salvation. We all need to imitate Jesus and live as witnesses all about God's promised love. And in this situation, all people are invited to partake. You don't have to be a member or anything because you see God's table is offered freely to everyone. An angel showed up at our door last Sunday and delivered our lamp and a bag. What a noble gesture to get us all started off in the Lenten season. I urge everyone to read the information throughout Lent as a reminder of encouragement, what Jesus means to each of us. Week two in the Lenten season is about sand, and the desert is full of it. Jesus walked around the desert and was constantly tempted by Satan. He always said no, of course. Sand is the basic ingredient for the foundation of buildings, roads, and streets. It's, it's tough and strong. Dry sand just flows around, sort of like dust that lands on your your house furniture. But with mixed, when mixed with a, an easy binder, seed, and water to be contained within itself, it makes a great physical foundation. Jesus is our spiritual foundation, like sand, along with special ingredients like faith, grace, kindness, gentleness, and all those good words that hold us together from the foundation of our lives. Jesus is our Savior. When we find ourselves tempted by bad things that we face every day in life, He is always there for us. All we need to do is ask Him for help in our time of need. He is such a blessing for backup when we are in some sort of trouble. Jesus began His ministry for us at the Lord's Supper table in His time with the disciples. And He said, Remember me 
with the bread and juice as we partake these this morning. Let us remember him. He is our foundation for spiritual life and goodness. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for bringing us Jesus into our found, into our lives. We welcome him into our hearts like we, he welcomes us into his arms. We appreciate the solid foundation he has offered us in our daily walk in life. Yes, all we need to do is ask when we need help or a boost to get us past problems, especially when he protects us from Satan, who is always there to tempt us to do evil. Amen. Our beloved Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after he gave thanks, he broke it, and then he held it up and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you do this, do this to remember me. And after supper, once again, he poured the wine, he blessed it, and gave thanks, and he shared it with those with him, and he said, this cup is my blood, my new covenant or blessing that I share with all. Each time you drink from this cup, remember me. And what you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink from this cup, you reenact your words and actions of the death of our master. I was thinking the other night about my uncle JD, who was a favorite uncle because he was kind of fun. He would tell jokes and do goofy things. And one of the things he liked to do, of course, was do a couple of magic tricks, which enthralled all of us children. The one that we liked the best, of course, was the one where he makes a quarter appear from behind your ear. <laughs> because uh, that quarter was free gratis. We didn't have to work for that like we did at home. And so, of course, that was quite a treat for us to get to have that free money. And it just reminded me that God provides everything we have free gratis. We don't have to work for it. I mean, yes, we have jobs and things, but God provides whatever we do, wherever we go, and whatever circumstance. In our church, needs us to give back some of those things that God gives us. So let us uh, receive our tithes and offerings. Let us bow for prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for all those things you provide for us each and every day, both little and big. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your great, very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans, to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram bought all of these to him, cut them in half, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. When the sun had set, 
and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. There was a story about a bishop who had an irrational fear that his legs were going to become paralyzed. So one night while he was at a dinner party, he reached down and he pinched his leg and he couldn't feel anything. So he became alarmed and he exclaimed out loud, oh no, it's just as I feared. I'm totally without feeling below my waist. But the lady sitting next to him turned and smiled. Well, if it's any comfort, your grace, she said, the leg you pinched was mine. Have you ever noticed that all kinds of things hit our panic button? Abram, or Abraham, as he would later be known, had returned from an incredible victory over four kings in Mesopotamia. And in this battle, he was not only successful on the battlefield against the four kings and their armies, but he acquired both wealth and stature in this new land which God had called him. No matter what accomplishments had happened, Abram was uncertain about his future and about God. So our story begins with a vision to Abram. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not. This was a direct communication from God to Abram. He was in doubt about the two promises God gave him about acquiring land and having a child. God reassured Abram because he was wavering in his faith. He was discouraged and he was uncertain about his future. You might say Abram was giving up on God's promises, thinking this was just too good to be true. We can all relate to what Abram was feeling, regardless of our age or circumstances. And we too, like Abram, have questions like, will my doctor who is younger than me really be able to help? How long will my health last? Will I catch COVID? Can I make it without being a burden to my children? What if I end up alone? I mean, these are just a few examples of our own fears, and I'm sure you can name many more. But you know what? We all know this is real life. Abram was uncertain about his future, and all of us have been there or will be there sooner or later. We know no matter what age we are, what it is to be afraid. In this chapter of Genesis, God appeared and communicated directly to Abram about his relationship with him. This is the first time God directly spoke. And God revealed that he was their protector and provided provider. As he said, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be great. This verse proclaimed two foundational truths that God wanted Abram to understand. The scripture is also for us to be aware of who God really is. Don't you think, especially under those circumstances that Abraham was experiencing, that he would have fallen down and worshiped the Lord for blessing and watching over him in so many ways? Don't you think he would have done that? But it doesn't happen. Instead, Abram complained to God, saying he was still childless. After all, for them, for he and Sarai, there was no one to carry on their name. And he expressed the pain of someone who was on the verge of giving up on waiting for God to keep his promises. Nevertheless, our Loving God does what he does best. And he responded lovingly and compassionately to Abram's complaint by telling Abram to look up to the sky and count the stars, if indeed he could count that many stars. Dr. Thomas G. Long 
tells of talking to a minister of another church in a dangerous part of a very large city. The pastor said he was always amazed by a certain woman, uh, a member of his church, who seemed to have no fear about coming to meetings and services at the church at night. And even though she had no car, then she would even have to walk home through the dark and frightening streets. And one night after a prayer service at which this woman had been attending, the minister was locking up the church and he happened to see this woman walking from the church down the street to her apartment. As she walked, she was holding her hand out as if some unseen companion were walking with her and holding her hand. And as she walked, she was humming a familiar spiritual, which said, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Do you think that woman was afraid? Do you think she let her fear defeat her? Absolutely not. She faced her fear and increased her faith because she trusted God. I mean, maybe she even looked up to the sky as Abram did and counted the stars. However, there might not have been as many stars in that very large city as Abraham saw, but I bet, I just bet there were enough to remind her and each of us that God is with us. What happened? What in the world happened that special night with God and Abram under the stars? Well, I believe there was a remarkable shift of focus from Abram to God. I mean, don't you think this is where the scripture reading for today is leading us? For you see, for Abram to believe God in spite of his circumstances, was nothing less than a miracle. You know, Abram, to believe that he was really okay, God spoke directly to Abram, and he believed. Then God credits to Abram as righteousness. Now, the word righteousness in the Bible means living up to the obligations essential in a relationship. In this specific situation, though, it meant that God was pleased through Abram's encounter to know that God would and could fulfill his promises. God takes the initiative in this situation to reassure Abram's faltering faith, and he trusted the Lord. If Abram can trust God, aren't we supposed to do the same thing? God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us. And shouldn't this be the good news that empowers our trust? God of the Old Testament and the New Testament keeps his promises. And God's relationship with us is when he is willing to risk his very self so that we might believe. Abram was just a normal everyday person like you and me. He was not more special than anyone else, but God communicated with him and even made a covenant with him. And that covenant was the blessing of Abraham and all of his ancestors. And that means you and me. We are Abraham's ancestors. Sometimes I think we think this is just a story in the Old Testament, and we tend to forget that it relates to us too. This is not just a story. It is our heritage, this blessing inherited through Abraham from God. So let me ask you, do you believe and trust God? Sometimes our mistaken ideas about faith and about God can cause us to be afraid. And still, when 
Life is difficult. We are never beyond God's loving and gracious care. Perhaps the idea of faith that Abram had is maybe it's foreign to us because we typically see faith as something that we provide and make happen instead of something that God gives us. But then again, you and I know that faith can only happen when we allow God to reveal it to us. We can only come to our faith through God's initiative, not ours. And when we gain this understanding, we begin to see faith as permitting God's authority to have control over our lives. I mean, have you ever heard of people developing a deep faith while they were in the midst of great despair or anguish? God does not cause pain or suffering on anyone, but when people are more vulnerable, they are more open to the power and purposes of God. As it says in this poem that I found by Charles D. Reap, it says, I am in deep, I cried out to God. I am deeper, God replied. How deep, I asked. Let's go and see God's side. Faith is allowing God to reach out to you wherever you may be. We can only believe when we allow God to reach out to us. And we can begin to understand faith when we read about Abram's change of heart when he attained righteousness through faith. Abram accepted God on God's terms and rested in the truth that God's plans and promises were first and foremost, even when the timetable seemed uncertain. He understood. And as Henry Nowen says in his writing, that hope is trusting that something will be fulfilled, but fulfilled according to the promises of God and not just according to our wishes. Abram knew that God was more than a vehicle for his promises and knew God was the Lord of his life. Even when Abram first believed, his circumstances did not change immediately. It was all about Abram's attitude that changed. He was transformed, you might say. Even in Abram's, Abraham's old age, he waited in hope. And he was confident that God's promises for him would be fulfilled. Abram looked towards the future with a renewed confidence, knowing the story would not end. And as in this quote from Adrian Rogers, it says, grace is God's acceptance of us. Faith is our acceptance of God accepting us. If Abraham believed God, and discovered that God would keep his promises, why can't we? When we open our lives to God's gift of faith, the promises of God takes on a whole new meaning. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And our faith statement provides us a vision like Abraham of what God desires for us along with the strength and conviction to live out our vision of faith. And again, quoted by Marcus Tullius Cicero, it says, next to God, we are nothing, but to God, we are everything. Hebrews 6.15 says, when God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And in Hebrews 11.8, it says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. In this piece called God's Day by Robert Burdett, it says this, there are two days in the week upon which and about which I never worry. Two carefree days kept sacredly free from 
fear and apprehension. One of these days is yesterday. Yesterday with its cares and frets and pains and aches, all its faults, its mistakes and blunders has passed forever beyond my recall. It was mine. It is now God's. And the other day that I do not worry about is tomorrow. Tomorrow with all its possible adversities, its burdens, its perils, its large promise and performance, its failures and mistakes is as far beyond my mastery as it is its dead sister yesterday. Tomorrow is God's day and it will be mine. There is left then for myself but one day, today. Any man can fight the battles of today. Any woman can carry the burdens of just one day. Any man can resist the temptation of today. It is only when we fully add the burdens of these two awful eternities, yesterday and tomorrow, such burdens as only the mighty God can sustain, that we break down. It isn't the experience of today that drives people mad. It is the remorse of what happened yesterday and fear of what tomorrow might bring. These are God's days. Leave them to God. No unbelief made Abraham waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew stronger in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. And so it is with every believer our justification by faith is the backdrop from which the rest of the story makes sense. God's covenant with us shines brighter than any stars Abraham saw that night. And we see, as Abraham saw, that it was not what we bring to the relationship, but what God gives to the relationship that makes it work. Instead of being sidetracked, on our journey of faith, do not let your life defeat you. God is at work in your hearts. He takes weak people like you and me and Abraham with no ability to save ourselves and saves us by himself for himself. The promises of God are based solely on grace, not merit. Therefore, even when we doubt, God will do a miracle of work of faith in our hearts. I hope this Lenten season gives you the opportunity to reflect upon your own life as we move towards Easter. And in so doing, I hope during this time, you hear the call of God to live a faithful life. I mean, isn't it time for us to follow Abraham's lead and open ourselves to God's plans for our lives? How about letting go and let your faith grow? Trust God even amongst your doubts and uncertainties, and he will not forget or forsake you. Let go and let God. I mean, this is what the life of faith is all about. Our Lenten journey marches still onward. Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem, and we travel that road with him. There are no faithful detours, nor can we rush to the end of the story. Let us depart in hope and confidence that although the wilderness of Lent stretches still before us, God's promises go with us today and always. Amen.